I have been running away from failure ever since I was first aware there was such a thing as a report card. I couldn't imagine anything worse than getting an F, the humiliation, the disgrace. So I made sure that I never did. I actually went through my school years believing that my grade point average and my self-worth were one and the same thing. Even though a 4.0 GPA was flimsy proof indeed of any kind of self-worth, but still a string of A's did offer some momentary consolation and camouflage, if you will, for my true failure as a boy, as a straight boy doing straight boy things, not like the other boys at all. It leaves me to wonder how many of us live our lives as if there will be a report card at the end, as if we will somehow be judged on, say, the meaning we made of our life, how important our work was, what kind of a parent or grandparent were we, how much stuff did we accumulate, or conversely, living with the bone-chilling fear that I must have been absent that day, unaware that this particular moral challenge would be on the final exam and I blew it. My grandmother, Barbara, was one tough cookie. So tough, in fact, that her standard reply to the greeting, how are you, was, I'm just as mean as usual. <laughs> I don't believe in failure, she would say. There's no such thing, because you can always learn something. It's a pretty commonly held perception, particularly among those given to positive thinking as a way of navigating through life, and certainly within the mythos of American notions of success. But what I found lacking in my grandmother's declaration was compassion. If I were brokenhearted that I didn't get the thing I wanted more than anything else, devastated really after working so hard to get it, I really didn't want to hear, well, I'm not going to feel sorry for you because you're going to learn something through this. That wasn't helpful at all in the moment, even if it proved to be true in time. Compassion, after all, only means to be with suffering, to be with it, not to fix it, not to correct it, not to advise it, not to compare it, just to be with it. It's not a small or easy thing. I would venture to say that authentic compassion for another and for ourselves might be the one true great healer, and yet it is not an attribute I've ever seen on any report card or any measuring stick for success. At the same time, I resonate deeply with the writings of Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl. In the end, everything can be taken from a man but this one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. So there it is. Maybe ultimately it's up to us to write our own report card, to call it a success or a failure. But I find myself struggling with this all too human urge to cast any verdict at all. This need to see life through this dualistic lens of win and lose, victory, defeat, success and failure, what if it is not so simple as that, so clear-cut as that? In the early 1990s, I had a fledgling design business which was doing rather well, but then a big economic downturn hit Los Angeles, and my business fell off to zero. I needed to do something quick. As a stopgap survival strategy, I took a standardized test called the CBEST test so that I could be hired as a substitute school teacher. And I was hired for Inglewood City Schools. Now, Inglewood at the time was a very depressed, underserved community in the Los Angeles area, predominantly people of color. And this was a few weeks after the Rodney King uprisings in LA. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but soon enough I discovered I did not have the constitution to face those schools every day. So on my off days, I volunteered at Project Angel Food, delivering home-cooked meals to homebound people with AIDS. These were the peak years of the AIDS crisis, before the drug cocktails came in. And I also got involved with a fledgling volunteer AIDS hospice group called Project Nightlight. But at the time, I felt like the loser of the world. 
No one could convince me otherwise. I assiduously avoided friends who might call me, dare to ask the unthinkable question, so what are you doing these days? What's more, I was convinced that somehow I was a spiritual failure, that God had somehow dispensed all the components necessary to live a successful life to everybody else except me, firmly attached to that idea. And yet when I look back on that point in time now, I see it as the pivot point that pointed me in this direction of chaplaincy, this career that I love so much, though it took so many years to materialize, and seems to make sense of the whole journey so far. So am I to look back on that time now and call it a blessing, a success, hurting so badly that I wanted to die? The older I get, I find the less patience I have with that black and white either or kind of thinking. In the world of cancer, our notions of success and failure grow much more complex. The stakes are much higher. If this disease means the imminent end of my physical body, does that mean that Western medicine failed? Does that mean that my doctor failed? Does that mean that this drug trial failed? Does that mean that my positive affirmations failed? My vegan diet failed? My prayers failed? God failed me? I failed God? These profound experiences of failure are not just the province of patience. Over the years, I've walked beside countless folks left behind, the bereaved, and they too wrestle almost universally with profound experiences of failure. If I hadn't spent so much time at work, I could have taken better care of her. She might still be here. If it weren't for my depression and anxiety, Michael, I know I caused her so much stress, and that's why the breast cancer came back. It's my fault. If I had just taken him to the doctor to get a second opinion, maybe we could have done something sooner. The thing about needing to cast a verdict one way or the other, I find, is that very seldom is there room for the verdict to be not guilty. Deanna is living with an aggressive colon cancer. She's also deeply rooted in a faith system that might best be described as New Age, believing that she can create and manifest her reality as she envisions it through positive prayer and affirmation and faith. And up until now, that faith system has worked rather well for her. She's found a wonderful mate. She continues to enjoy success in her real estate business. She's a planner and a goal setter. She likes goals with nice, measurable outcomes. So each win only solidifies and deepens her faith that much more, kind of proves it, in fact. How could it be otherwise? But now the tables have turned, and her disease is progressing, and it's metastatic. That whole paradigm of goal setting becomes far more murky, complicated. If cure is medically off the table, what's the most she can hope for? Just more time living with cancer. What's more, she feels like a spiritual failure. I guess, Michael, that my prayers weren't good enough. My attitude must not have been positive enough. My affirmations were not strong enough. Over 20 years ago, I was covering an overnight on-call shift at the UCLA Medical Center. It was late on a Sunday night, and I was paged to come up to the ICU because an elderly woman, uh, the matriarch, of a large African-American family was very near death, and the family wanted some support and a prayer. I offered them that, and I left, and a few hours later, the pager went off again, and I was summoned to come back to the ICU because the woman had passed. Now the family just wanted company while they waited for their pastor to arrive. Once he arrived, he took one look at the scene, and he said, it looks like you all didn't pray hard enough. as if this loving family had failed their mother, as if death itself is a failure. And if that's true, all of us are guaranteed an F on our final report card. Spiritual success, spiritual failure, these are tricky concepts, again, with the either-or kind of thinking, over the years, I've walked beside countless folks, many with no faith at all, many with deep religious faith, and everyone in between. 
but all with this common longing, this quest for strength. I wish I were stronger. I wish I believed more. I wish I had stronger faith. When we tease that apart, what do you mean by that, stronger faith? It usually means certainty. I want to know that I'm going to beat this cancer. I want to know this drug trial is going to work. I want to know that I have the best oncologist. There's a German-American theologian, Paul Tillich, who says the opposite of faith isn't doubt. It's certainty. If I'm certain, I'm not really walking in faith anymore, am I? To me, faith might better be described as a willingness to step off into the unknown with my doubts and fears in tow and continuing to walk anyway. With my eyes and heart open with humility, with curiosity, with compassion, even for those parts of myself that feel like a failure. With Deanna, who liked to set goals with nice, measurable outcomes, we looked at what another spiritual goal might be that may not have such a measurable outcome. What about a goal of coming to peace with uncertainty, with doubt, with powerlessness, offering herself the grace to be a human being? Over these last few years that we've gotten out of the pandemic, it's a little tricky to remember just what it was that we went through, those extreme measures we had to endure, and there was no telling when it would all be over. Do you remember what that was like? And in those years, there were those among us, myself included, who sought to somehow reframe or redefine what spiritual success looked like because the times seemed to demand it. And there were those eternally optimistic spiritual folks who likened this to a golden opportunity, a chance to hit the reset button for life on planet Earth, to refine and distill all the extraneous and get down to the bare essentials. And they embraced this. Not me. I grieved. I never realized how much of an extrovert I am, that for me, real human contact Interaction, engagement is like oxygen. It may even come close to the meaning of life itself. So much so that for me, sitting in a darkened, sold-out theater, knee-to-knee -knee with strangers, anticipating being moved to laughter or tears by humanity on a stage, was a religious rite. It was a ritual just as it is every Saturday afternoon to gather with my dancing chums in the same dance class and dance to the same music in front of the same mirror, and afterward getting to partake in Holy Communion, getting to complain about everything that hurts. <laughs> just as it is to travel to some far, faraway country and get lost in some alleyway among a bunch of strangers, many of whom may never have even heard of Los Angeles just as it is to hug someone in trouble, a family member, a friend, a patient. So much so that when these experiences were off the table for the indefinite future, I'm embarrassed to say a part of me wondered whether life was even worth living. Not like those spiritually optimistic folks at all. And I would give myself an F. Bernadette, 31 years old, so bright, engaging, curious. She seems to live life from the place of, gee, I wonder what that would be like. So much so that when she first started her chemotherapy and her beautiful red hair began to fall out, we greeted that with a kind of conversation that I often have generally with women about how they're going to meet this crucible. And some will choose to preemptively shave their heads and some will choose to make a lighthearted ritual out of it, dye their hair pink and invite friends over for a shaving party. No, Bernadette said, I just think it'd be really interesting to see what it'd be like to have your hair fall out, piece by piece. And when that year had come to a close, she was complete with her treatment, she was reflecting back on the year, and she said, Michael, I guess when I look back on it all in all, I'd have to say it was a pretty good year after all. Bernadette, 
In a year that includes a cancer diagnosis, chemotherapy, radical double mastectomy, reconstruction surgery, radiation, if that doesn't make for a bad year, what on earth would? I don't know, she said, losing my sense of humor, I guess. A spirit like that cannot be broken. I walked beside Grace over the last six years of her life, ovarian cancer. She had lived a life of dizzying twists and turns, zigzagging her way across the country, both personally and professionally. I asked her once, Grace, if there were a young person in your life, maybe a grandchild, and they wanted a piece of advice, Grace, what have you learned after such an interesting life? What piece of advice do you have for somebody like me? She didn't waste any time at all coming up, coming up with an answer. When the time comes, be ready to go, she said. She actually echoes Joseph Campbell as he describes the hero's journey. In order to be a hero, he said, you must be prepared for when the moment comes. Donna and Lois had shared the better part of 50 years together over the last years of their life. They were in their late 70s, so devoted, so at ease with one another, creating family in a culture that is largely hostile to two women calling themselves a family. Over the last eight years, Lois had been living with ovarian cancer, and as her disease progressed, she chose to take advantage of aid in dying medication available in California for when the going got to be too rough. She was a no-nonsense gal, bright, engaging, always wanted to know much more about you than wanting to tell her story one more time. Sometimes it was hard to know just how much suffering she was carrying because she did it with such grace. Though she was thoroughly contemporary, knew her way around a computer, she was also steeped in old school virtues like letter writing and sending thank you notes. Late one Saturday night, she leaned over to Donna and said, honey, I think the time's come and I'm gonna take the medication tomorrow morning. Well, if it's that bad, why not take it now? I can't, I've got too many things to do. What do you have to do that's so important? Well, I have some birthday cards to send and some thank you notes to write and some bills to pay. I'll help you do that, she said. So on the last night of her life, after 70 some years on planet Earth, she spent it intentionally sitting around the dining table with her beloved Donna engaged in the most mundane activities. But activities that are nevertheless rooted in kindness and consideration. That is an image of spiritual success in my book. She got up the next morning, she put on her best red silk pajamas and she said, I might as well go out in style. If there were such a thing as a spiritual report card, I would give them both an A plus. As I would to Bernadette for her unfailing curiosity and acceptance and humor, as I would to Grace for her unbelievable capacity to ride the wave of life, spiritual strength, spiritual success, you bet, and not a shred of certainty in sight. I'm a big documentary film fan. I, re I remember, oh gosh, almost 30 years ago now, an Oscar-nominated documentary called Troublesome Creek. It's the story of a family farm in Iowa that had been in the family for generations, over 100 years. Russell and Mary continue to work the farm, although they're quite a bit older now. They're having raised their kids who have all gone away. But the farm is facing foreclosure. So it's all hands on deck. All the kids come back to Iowa to do what they can to try to save the family farm. We're given to believe it will kill mom and dad if they lose the farm. So you're kind of dying a little bit as you watch them auction off the livestock and the farm equipment and their furniture. You see Mary caressing her Ethan Allen dining table. Oh, the Thanksgiving dinners I've served at this table. Sold. They can't lose the farm. But they do, and they have to move into town, and to everyone's amazement, Russell and Mary flourish. Russell's a new man, unencumbered by all that backbreaking labor and nonstop worry. One of these guys that has those wild, untamed, bushy eyebrows, you wonder, what's up with the eyebrows, Russell? And there he is in the barbershop getting them all trimmed up, looking his best. 
I'll never forget the last line of the film, narrated by their daughter, Jean. Success and failure. Sometimes it's hard to tell which is which. Yes, it is. So be it.